Folks, it has been a busy 72 hours for Bethune-Cookman University uh, after uh, Ed Reed announced on Saturday that he had been dismissed as head football coach. They were negotiating a contract. Uh, they had not signed it yet, uh, and he said he was not pulling out. The Board of Trustees made the decision to move in a new direction. We'll show you later uh, that particular video uh, that he put out. Uh, there were a couple of videos before that caused a lot of consternation uh, among um, HBCU folks, and Bethune-Cookman folks, because he was highly critical of the university, practices there, was complaining about conditions of the university, trash and things along those lines. Uh, and when he made the announcement on Saturday uh, that he was not gonna be the head of football coach, uh, students then, football players, launched a petition that they signed uh, asking that he be uh, returned, uh, be hired as head football coach. Uh, today, there was a rally on campus from students complaining about other conditions at Bethune-Cookman. Uh, this is not the first time the university has had controversy. Uh, they uh, had significant financial issues, almost lost their accreditation, uh, and many have said uh, that the problem there is its board of trustees. Uh, alumni uh, are engaged in a lawsuit with the board of trustees. There's a lot of things that are going on there, and so what is the current state of Bethune-Cookman? Um, what is the administration saying about what took place with today's protest? Joining us right now is the interim president of Bethune-Cookman, Dr. Lawrence Drake. Dr. Drake, glad to have you here on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Um, and so there's several things that I want to cover uh, over these next two segments. And so let's just walk through this. Um, um, Ed Reed said he did not want to step down. He was not pulling out. Uh, whose decision was it for him not to become the head coach? Was it you, the interim president, or was it the board of trustees? It was the interim president. It was my decision. It was your decision. Yes. And so um, why did you make that decision not to move forward uh, with Ed Reed? So we, um, as you know, uh, about Sunday, a week ago, we, uh, well, let me back up. Actually, starting in December, we were working on a contract for uh, naming Ed Reed as the head coach. I interviewed Ed, and I had three important things that I asked him to ensure that he was willing to do as part of becoming uh, part of the Wildcat family. One was, I needed him to really understand that we were a Christian institution that behavior and character were clearly our priorities. And I asked him if that was okay with him. Could he abide by that? Could he, you know, position himself as a role model for our student athletes as well as for the university itself? He indicated he would. Second question I ask is, well, great. I'm glad you're willing to do that. I need to know if you're also willing uh, to build the kind of program uh, that will allow you, because you've not been a coach, uh, before. This is an opportunity for you to be a head coach your first time. The university is giving you an opportunity to do that. And therefore, we want to surround you with the kind of people that can draw up the X and O's and help you become a stronger coach. He said, I get that. And I'm willing to do that. The third thing, as I said, this is not University of Miami and it's not the NFL. Uh, we just came through two hurricanes, six million dollars worth of damage, much of what we've been working on for the last year and a half is improvements not only to the university's infrastructure, but also a long-term investment plan. We have about $100 million that we need to invest in the university over the next several years. We said to him, look, you're going to become part of that. Are you open to helping us do that and build the program? He said yes to that. So when we saw the first video, uh, criticizing the university and saying, well, it's trashy and my office is dirty and all that. First of all, he was an employee of the university and he had not an office. When the last staff moved out, we started renovating that building, everything from the coaches' rooms to the other places. We had given him some permission um, that he really took to the next level. First of all, he wasn't authorized to even take video. He wasn't authorized to do any of those things, but he did them anyway. The university had to take responsibility for that because it happened. But quite as kept, you know, that isn't the kind of behavior that we would expect. And then the expletives and the, you know, those kinds of things in that first video, you might call that an aberration. And I would say it could be. And you have to be a forgiving individual. But when you have this much damage, you look at the gym and you look at this video and you look at it critically. But I would invite anyone to come to our campus because... All parts of our campus don't look that way. 
Um, we are really trying to work hard to clean it up. And given the fact that, again, we suffered two hurricanes back to back um, and because of supply chain issues, because most people in Florida, particularly central Florida, are still recovering. I have people from my staff living on our campus because their homes were destroyed. Um, it Dr. never took, that didn't take those things into account. Doctor, hold tight one second. Continue our conversation with Dr. Lawrence Drake, who's the interim president at Bethune Cookman. Doctor Drake, you were talking about uh, the conditions, uh, him not being allowed to uh, shoot video uh, on campus. Um, what was was it? The second video. What was the final straw? What caused it? Uh, where uh, you uh, made this, made the decision that uh, we're not moving forward with Ed Reed as coach. I think the final straw was actually the third or fourth video, one with the background music being booties, butts, and boobs, uh, and hoes. Um, and, you know, we have 65% of our campus is female. Uh, and my view is, is that we are trying to build young men to respect black women. We're trying to build a culture where they understand that, that, that I, you know, people can say whatever they want to say. But we think you can do anything respectfully. And when we think about the culture that we're trying to build, that we have companies and partners like Disney and, and some of our other partners calling saying, what are you going to do about that? We can't support that kind of image. Uh, and, and, and of course, they're one of our biggest sponsors for the classic. So you're saying you're saying Disney officials with Disney called you complaining about Ed Reed and saying we can't support Bethune Cookman if this if he is going to represent the university. They didn't say we can't. They questioned what we were going to do. And I think that was an appropriate way to approach it. But they so, weren't the only. So were they implying that they, that they would pull support if he continued as head coach? I think that as a leader, you have to make the decision. And if they make if they are inquiring, they have a vested interest. They believe in the image that they want to project. And you have to think, you know, what are the possible outcomes of you continuing to do what you're doing? Um, but here's the bigger point, and I, and I think this is the most important thing for me, is that, you know, a, as a dad and as a, a father, and certainly as someone who's been given the responsibility of looking after these young people, um, I just didn't feel that at this point, and I conferred with a number of people. Yes, there are a group of alumni who believe that the decision was, you know, maybe the incorrect one. But there was also a legion of people, including former players, including people like Larry Little, who's also a Hall of Famer, who is a Bethune-Cookman graduate. And some of those people are coming to campus this week to talk to our players. Uh, we're going to have a, a small cadre of the captains on Wednesday, and then we'll have a team meeting Wednesday night. And we're going to tell the facts. The facts are, is that, you know, this university has weather tremendous storms and and you mentioned in your opening about the financial condition and the accreditation we not only have survived that accreditation but we've received now a 10-year accreditation so we are free and clear we're also solvent as a university in the but, but, but your predecessor the reality is a lot of that goes to your predecessor who the board then eventually fired and, and and you have alumni. I've I've had alumni reach out to me uh, and saying that uh, they they have serious concerns that the board of trustees is not providing real leadership to Bethune Cookman, and that even though surviving that, they they they, they said they still are uh, shocked to understand why they would fire the president who led Bethune. Uh, you know, you know, to reviving that uh, and the concerns that there's this constant turnover that there's there's this constant drama. What do you say to those students who were on the campus today, angry, protesting, not just football players, but students right. talking about yeah. mold and other conditions? What do you say to them? What I say to them is what I've been saying to them because I walk the campus every day when I'm on campus. What I say to them is that we're working on the issues. I just invested a quarter of a million dollars in one of our buildings for remediation of mildew. You know, when you have a hurricane, when you are 80 and 90 degree weather in Florida, the Florida conditions are not like the Florida, are not like the Chicago conditions. They're not like other places. I'm from the East Coast, so I know what those conditions are. That's mildew. That's not necessarily mold, by the way. Some of that that you're showing on the screen is a function of things sitting in water for a period of time. So they're not showing you everything. Yes, there are some of those kinds of things, but you might also see that those portions of the building may not even be used. 
So again, we are working very diligently to clean up a lot of these things. When I, I would I would reflect that the first hurricane, Hurricane Ian, um, we were the first university to evacuate in the state of Florida. Had we not done that, uh, we probably would have had casualties because it was a very violent storm. But what happened was is that we were trying very hard to get those students back to campus within two to three weeks. And we spent an enormous amount of money doing that. Our football players, as an example, were out because we couldn't bring them back to campus. The university just wasn't fit for that at the time. We spent a tremendous amount of resources ensuring that they ate well, that they stayed in the best places, that they were taken care of, that they had their tutors on site. The hundred students that are out there today, if you hold up Dr. Bethune's uh, picture and you, you, know, you talk about her legacy at her gravesite, the thing to understand is that many of the students, we're trying to teach them what Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune stood for. You see, the fact is she fired Zora Neale Hurston for acting out and not being respectful of the culture that she was trying to build. And at that time, of course, that didn't necessarily go over well with people who love Zora Neale Hurston. But if you are going to start a culture and create a culture of excellence, you got to make decisions. Now, one thing about our students today, I was very proud of them. I don't think there's anything wrong with student activism and expressing your point, and they should. And we're going to continue to talk to them about that. We're going to be meeting with student leaders as well. But I don't, I'm not running away from the issues that they raise because some of them are valid. There are things we need to do, but it takes money and it takes time. And it's not going to happen overnight. You know, we brought in our largest freshman class this year, uh, the largest one in the history of the university, at least in the last two decades. Over a thousand students joined us in September of last year. We're on track now for another 1,200 students to join us in the fall of 2023. And so while I'm excited about this and while there are challenges, we have to raise about $250 million over the next several years in order to ensure that our campus gets up to date, the fortification. We'll be waiting on FEMA for a lot of the reimbursement for some of those things. But the other part of this is that many of the alumni uh, who complain and who say, you know, they need the board of trustees to do more. You know, I can't speak on that. I can only tell you as president, um, I haven't I haven't been concerned about the board of trustees. You talk about the turnover of presidents. You know, the fact of the matter is this university is only on its eighth president. That's eight presidents in 118 years. So although there's been some turnover of late, I can't blame a university for wanting to try to find the best person to lead it. The previous predecessor or the person who I uh, was a successor to, he retired after 42 years with the university. Uh, the person before that, uh, he left the university to go run Bentley University today in Boston, which is where he is. So the fun, the, the, you know, it's important to have all the facts and to have context. It's easy to look at this, you know, from an unbalanced perspective. But what I'm trying to do tonight, and what I will continue to do on other broadcasts and in some of our statements, uh, I'm going to be writing an op-ed about this as well. Is we need to make sure that the message is balanced because. You know, social media can distort the message and and give an impression that's really doesn't have all the facts and certainly doesn't have context. Um, I was I like I said, I was not at all concerned about the behavior of our students today. They acted and behaved tremendously well. And I was very proud of them. What I want them to do, though, is to be able to focus on other activist uh, measures that need to be taken. We're talking about African-American studies being banned in the state of Florida. I want them to protest about that. I want them to protest about voting more. Um, I want to teach them the importance of public policy. Uh, I want them to understand that, you know, you just can't say everything that you want to say, regardless of whether or not you might think it. It may not be appropriate in that venue. And that doesn't mean you have to be neutered or not or inauthentic. But it does mean that you have to understand the audience. We're trying to raise money. We're trying to create a culture where we can grow that university. And we have to have plenty of people to do that. And the people who count, the people who matter, are our students. But we also have to look at the community in which would give to that university to support those students. And we just felt at this point it wasn't a good fit for Ed and I or Ed and the university to agree on what kind of conditions he would have to um, 
come to and help us create and help us grow, he wasn't in agreement with that. He felt that he needed to say his piece and call attention to the challenges as opposed to the opportunities. I can't blame him for that. I don't have anything bad to say about Ed. Um, it just wasn't appropriate for us to make the decision to continue contract negotiations. You, you, you made a point about the leadership there. Uh, there was a piece uh, that uh, was from uh, the uh, Florida Courier where they talked about what needed to happen. And they talked about how uh, one of the presidents, uh, Kreit, uh, who dealt with a number of different issues, the board fired him. Uh, and based upon the, the publisher, we're going to have him on the show later, uh, led them through uh, that and then was replaced. You had the, the current board, the board chair uh, tried to put his name into the hat to be the president, but they found him not to be qualified to hold the position. But now he's also the board chair. Uh, and so what I really want to get at, and I have another break coming up. And so we can come back and you can answer this um, yeah. because what I, again, uh, I've got a lot. And here's the deal. I've, I've, I've spoken at Bethune Cookman, I think two or three times. I've addressed their alumni uh, as well uh, in terms of, in terms of, in terms of fundraising. I was last, they were past uh, pastor Marvin Winans uh, several years ago, addressing um, uh, a, a men's program there. And what you, what you were describing, I'll be perfectly uh, frank is in a stark contrast to what, one, I'm hearing from alumni, two, parents of actual players. You've got parents of players posting uh, stuff on social media saying players are sharing uh, helmets, that there are no showers for the players there, that the players yeah. are washing their own clothes. And so, yeah, right. so I wanna do this here, I, wanna, I gotta go to this commercial break. Uh, when we come back, I want, if, if we can address that uh, specifically, uh, because there's some of the things I, 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 want, I want you to address uh, and we'll do so. We're talking with interim president, Dr. Drake uh, of Bethune Cookman. Dr. Drake, uh, this is a tweet uh, from um, from an individual uh, said, bro, don't tell me nothing about no HBCU. I got kids that played at BC Athletics for the past three years, and they told me they were sharing helmets. Come on, man, stop playing with me. Ed Reed was the best thing for that school. They have the same mentality as the city I'm from, uh, BG. Uh, I, I've also, others have said to me that there are no showers for the players. They're washing their own uniforms and clothes. Is that true? No. And the fact of the matter is, is that, again, I would say you've been to BCU. Come down and visit. I'll show you. Well, actually, here's the deal. I, I, would, I would love to do this here. I would actually love to bring the show down and actually do a town hall on the campus with you, the board, and the students. And in fact, uh, I got to pick up an award from the Trayvon Martin Foundation on February 5th. Uh, and so I would love to do this February 2nd or 3rd. Yeah, we're not go we're not going to have the board, and I'll tell you why. When I said earlier, you know, I made the decision. Obviously, the buck stops at my desk. The board is not charged with the responsibility of making decisions on personnel. That's, that, the that's personnel, but the but the board does, or the board should be playing a role when it comes to fundraising. The board should they, be playing they, a role. They should, they should, but again, much of the comments that were made about the board of trustees, frankly. If you were if I was to put all the board of trustees in that crowd today, most of the, those students would not know who they are. And, and that's actually a good thing because that isn't the job of the board of trustees. They have three responsibilities, governance, fiduciary and uh, strategy. That's their three important roles. There are people, My, but, 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 but there are critics who say they're not doing that. Well, because, because that. of the university issues over the last several years. Well, here's what I would say. I've been at the university for, you know, just under two years, um, you know, and you also, of course, do work with my alma mater, Fisk University. I could tell you the same things about a lot of places in the HBCU community. Because well, yeah, Fisk has had six presidents in 15 years, and listen, that's a problem. I understand that. And the point is, is that there's all kinds of issues with leadership, um, and we have not sometimes tackled those things as a community, and I'm talking about the black community as it relates to all of our universities, but here what I tell you, you know, it's easy to throw stones as opposed to really being active in trying to make it better. Our university alumni giving, as an example, is extremely low uh, on an annualized basis. So uh, many people, uh, What's the percentage? It's less than 1% this year. Let, let, less than 1% this year. If that's that, okay, so the national average is really around 4 to 5%. We know Claflin is the highest one HBCUs. Cla Cla Claflin is 50%. So here's the question. 
Here's a question. Why is that? Is it because is, 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 is alumni giving for Bethune so low because they don't trust leadership? Well, if you go back 25 years, that might you, you might be able to make that statement, except 25 years would say that's not the case because this has been a continuing bell ringer every year. If you look at the alumni giving going back 25 years, you could see alumni giving still somewhere around 11, 12 percent which is not bad. However, in the last decade and a half, it's been less than that. And you say, well, that's what is that about? Is that because they don't trust leadership? Here's the reality. The fact is, in America, and when you look at the black community in particular, the amount of wealth that we are using and the philanthropic giving back to universities, particularly HBCUs, has been extremely low. It's lower at Fisk. It's lower at a lot of universities. Well, I, I, first of all, first of all, I, I totally understand Dr. Drake. And look, I've covered yeah. that. I've spoken. You, you that. understand, right? No, no, but no, but but but, but I, 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 no, I understand it. But here's the issue that I have: because we talk about alumni giving, okay? We're talking about a quarter. We're talking about a dollar. So when we're talking about alumni giving, this is not always one percent people giving a thousand dollars. It's literally not even giving a dollar. That's the, correct. The, 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 the reality is, if it used to be eleven or twelve percent and it's dropped to 1%, there has to be a reason. So has, Beth- so has reason. Bethune no. Cookman asked his alumni, why have you stopped giving? Okay, what's, what's the reason? Let me tell you the reason. The reason is, is that when you look at the, at the wealth creation of the generation just before us and the one that we're in, the average salaries of most of those people are declining and their ability to give back has to do with the debt that they're having to amass to go to college in the first place. Not even, here's the deal, I get it, but I, I've heard that from many different people. Well, the numbers, the numbers are true. I can show you the numbers, you know, but, every way but Sunday. But we're talking about, and again, I get that, but and I get that part. But Dr. Drake, I, you, I, I just, you can't leave out the reality that when Bethune was going through its accreditation issues, its financial issues, I mean, the university was a mess. Folks are talking about it might close. That also impacts whether or not somebody has the trust to hand over their dollar, even if they got 20 bucks that they trust is going to be taken care of properly. So here, here's, here's what I'd say to that. If you don't trust it, give it to a student. Give it to a student that can pay their tuition. Make it an unrestricted fund that the university doesn't touch it. It's a pass through. If you really believe that, that's what you would do. But you see, the point is the narrative can't be one sided. It can't be that, you know, it's all about the university's leadership. It is a it is a cultural thing that we have to continue to, you know, change and and modify and grow. And by the way, in the final analysis, we don't do this work. I don't do this work because I need to be president or because, you know, being president is is, you know, all this and all that. I do this work because it is about the students. At the end of the day, the only reason for the university existing is for those students. And our job, my job, is to figure out the best way to use the resources we have, and in many cases, limited. We're a private HBCU. We don't get the kind of funds that even FAMU gets. You're private in their state. Yes. We have to do, we have to do everything on the basis of that. So when you talk about a six million dollar impact to your to your revenue base uh, when you did not budget that when that wasn't even you know thought about because of two major weather events and you talk about some buildings that are you know some in some cases twenty to thirty years old and then you have soil erosion that happens as a result of a massive weather event that you didn't anticipate those are not things that the students would consider and I, I can't say I blame them because they don't know it's not the context in which they operate. So so what so what are you so here's the question. Uh, how often are you sharing the information with the students? How often are you talking to them, bringing them along so they actually understand that that's first. Second of all, when it comes to your university budget, how much of your budget is dependent upon the financial aid of students? 80, 85, 90%, what is it? Well, first of all, uh, you asked really three questions, not two. So let me give you the first answer. The first question, the first question I think you asked was, you know, how often do we talk to students? Uh, we have a, a, an SGA. We have a student government. Um, I meet with that student government as often as I can. But most importantly, we have a number of venues in which we talk to students about what's going on. 
Um, and we offer opportunities for students to be engaged in many ways, whether it's through the Divine Nine, whether it's through SGA. There's all kinds of ways for them to be involved and understand what's going on at the university. Um, so that's one thing. Could we do more of that? Yes, I think we could. And in this situation, I'm going to actually step up my participation in those things because I think it's necessary. It's part of the reason why I'm talking with you tonight. The second question was, you know, what percentage of our budget is actually dependent on tuition? All universities in America, particularly HBCUs, are single source revenue models. That means that the majority of their revenue comes from tuition and fees. Um, the fact of the matter is that those tuition and fees drive everything. Uh, they drive how much you can spend. They drive what your capital budget is. They drive what kinds of things you're able to do. They drive your dining facilities. They drive everything. And so our job is to really try to figure out how we can continue to grow that population and at the same time be able to prioritize the spending. It's, but it's, the, 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 re the, re the reason I ask the question is because yeah. – if, if, if your budget is dependent upon that financial aid from the students. Not financial aid. It isn't financial aid. I'm sorry. But the, the, in terms of obviously their tuition and what they're spending, what's driving it, those are your customers. Those, are, th those are the people you That's absolutely correct. have to satisfy and their parents. And if you have these, if you have these students and the parents who right now are saying they're not happy, you've got a problem. Because if they all of a sudden say, hey, we're not going to go to Bethune-Cookman, all of a sudden you see an enrollment drop, your financial pressures are now exacerbated. Well, quite honestly, that's what happened during COVID. Uh, that's what has happened when you have, you're not able to recruit. So during the times we were having financial difficulty, we had that. But here's the other point. The other point is that the university um, has tried to rebound from that. And that doesn't happen in a day. I mean, you, you would know this, I think, as well as anyone, that these endeavors are long-term things. When you're talking about turning around an institution, in some cases, it's like running a startup, and I've done that. It's like being able to go out and raise funds and get people to buy into an idea, which our founder did. She had a I, I get it. Look, look, I ran, I ran, look, I ran, look I've, run, I've run three black newspapers. I ran Chicago Defender. They lost money for 20 consecutive years. It was called the Chicago Offender. It was awful. I absolutely get it. But the one thing, though, that I, that, that I do understand why, because we had made a profit my second year, about 100 grand, and 400 grand my third year, is that stable leadership, laying out vision, communicating strategy, and then executing was a part of that. And again, I think what's really happening here, and I'll give you the final minute to, uh, to respond to this, is that, and again, I am hearing it. We're going to hear from these folks in a little bit. You have got people who are alumni and students who are upset. I understand there's a lawsuit against uh, your alumni association. Um, is that correct? Well, we're in litigation with not our alumni because that alumni association doesn't exist anymore. We have an alumni. Hold on, hold on. What, hap what, is that? what happened to the alumni association? Well, first of all, the university decided it was going to go to a different model in terms of its alumni structure, which meant that instead of having chapters, we were going to have you be able to give directly to the university because our chapters weren't raising any money in the old structure. And therefore, we said, OK, we're going to go to a direct relationship model with the university, which most universities in the country have today, 99% of them, including HBCUs. So we changed our model, but what happened is, is that we got into litigation as they started to use some of the trademarks and seals of the university without our permission once it was no longer authorized to do so. So it's not, that's not our alumni association. Here's what I'd also say to you. So you don't actually have an alumni association, right? Yes, now. we do. It's called BCUAA. We have, okay, our, so we, have an, we have an alumni association, which we're not in litigation with. Okay, so what, so the old alumni association, that's what you're in litigation with. That's correct. And when and did the drop take place? You said they weren't raising money before. Are you raising more money now than you? Yes, before? we are. Yes, we are. And the point is this. I got about 20 the, seconds. Go a, ahead. DSO, a DSO model is is what we've aspired to. That's what we're doing. We're we're really bringing alumni in and talking to them about the conditions of the institution and what needs to happen. So, you know, there is a faction of alumni. There's a faction of parents. But I can tell you this. When we evacuated that university 
And we made sure that every student got home safe. And we had 32 students from the international that we had to, you know, put uh, in shelter and keep take care of them for until we were able to get them back to campus. The number of letters and calls that I got about, thank you for taking care of my kids. Thank you for looking after me. I could only get to campus on the weekend. You, you made the announcement soon enough. We don't hear those stories. And there's a lot of those as well. All right, Dr. Drake, uh, we still appreciate you joining us Uh, again. uh, I am more than willing to bring our show to the campus uh, to do a town hall with you and the students on alumni. Uh, Like I say, I got to be in Florida next week. So you tell me whether uh, next Thursday or Friday works. One of those works. We'll do it. I appreciate it, man. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, my producer, we're waiting to hear from you. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. All right, folks, back to that Mark unfiltered video in just one moment. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. 